right, so today we're going to be finishing off 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and then also beginning the first part of chapter 3. They kind of tie in together. And I've titled today's message, You've Been Chosen and Called. You've Been Chosen and Called. All right, well, if you were with us last week, um, or even if you weren't, um, we covered the first 12 verses of chapter 2. And there Paul described the doom of the Antichrist and his followers. It was a really uh, great message, great um, passage that we covered. Well, in today's passage that we're going to be looking at, especially that the first part of the passage, um, Paul now will turn to the Thessalonian Christians and really consider and starts to consider their calling and destiny. And he will do this by way of contrast. He will show um, many of the differences there of their, again, destiny and their calling. Um, for us in particular, this message, our message today will focus on some of the responsibilities to God's truth that believers have. Now, I don't know, again, if you're today consider yourself a believer, but uh, this passage, our passages we're going to be covering today, will focus on some of those responsibilities that we have. So before I read today's passage, let's pray and Ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, that you have us here. Lord, uh, there's a reason and purpose why um, everything happens. And we may not understand it here and now, but we know and trust and believe that you have a reason. And, and it's always good because you're a good God. Lord, I pray that you will speak now powerfully through your word to everyone that's here and those that are watching this live message or listening to this later on, listen to the recording later on, that you will change lives, hearts, relationships. You will draw people closer to you. We want nothing more than for your name to be glorified. Lord, we seek truth. We seek your love. We seek your grace now. So fill this room with your spirit. And we just hear from you now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, I left off last week in verse 12, so I'll be starting in verse 13. And I'm going to be finishing off that chapter in this particular reading. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. <coughs> and the Word of God says, but we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by God, because from the beginning God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, Stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and, and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. 
in this last section of chapter 2, Paul transitioned, transitions from what he had just taught them in the first 12 verses of this chapter about the day of the Lord, the coming of the Antichrist, what to look for. And again, it's important to note also that as believers, we won't be here during that horrible tribulation period. But he transitions from that now to an exhortation about how to live life now in light of that day. And so he repeats, and so he begins by repeating the same idea that he had back in chapter 1, verse 3. How he and his companions felt obligated to continually thank God for his work among the Thessalonian believers. Now back then, in, back there in chapter 1, the motive for that thanksgiving was the growing faith and love that was clearly evident among the believers there at that church. But here now, in this second thanksgiving, Paul has in mind their calling and their destiny. So he informs his spiritual brothers and sisters the reasons they're loved by God. First reason is because from the beginning, God has chosen, had chosen them for salvation. What he's saying here is that before the creation of the world, before life began, before the universe was created, God specifically picked them out to be saved. God chose them for salvation. But not because of their love for Him or as a reward for anything they accomplished, anything they did. No. God chose them because of His love for them. Now, as great and as amazing and beautiful as God's love is, that alone doesn't save people. If that were the case, then the whole world would be saved. But it's not. Love must be proven through action, which God did when He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. So when a person places their faith and trust in Christ, God's love reveals itself by His grace and mercy. And so it kind of looks like this. God, in His grace, gives us through Christ what we don't deserve. And God, in His mercy, doesn't give what we do deserve. But Paul isn't done here. After telling him that from the beginning God chose them for salvation, he goes on to tell them the method of their salvation. He writes there, through sanctification, by the Spirit, and through the belief in the truth. See, my friends, this means God uses this, this means God uses to effect salvation the work of His Holy Spirit who sets aside chosen individuals for lives of holiness and separation from sin. In other words, the Holy Spirit regenerates, indwells, and bap baptizes Christians into the body of Christ. On the other hand, there's the human aspect of salvation, 
There's the human aspect of salvation. That's the belief in the truth of the gospel. It's choosing to believe in the truth of the gospel. That's the human aspect, the human responsibility. So the Holy Spirit then uses the word of God to purify the believer's life. So again, there are two aspects of salvation. God's election and man's choice. Other people call it God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Here's the thing, both are necessary. Both are important. Some people can only see God's election and by doing so they imply that man can, can't do anything about it. Others overemphasize man's aspect and neglect God's sovereign choice. See, the truth lies in both extremes. Election and human responsibility are both Bible doctrines. And so therefore, I, I believe that it's important to teach both, even if we can't understand how both can be true. Whenever a passage, we approach a passage that teaches God's sovereignty, God's election, then we'll teach on that. If we come on a passage in the Bible that teaches man's responsibility, man's choice, then we will cover that. As I just said, both are important. Both are necessary. I once heard it described like a railroad track. They're both going in the same direction. They're both going in a straight line, but eventually they, they will meet or two separate railroad tracks, I'm sorry, that will eventually merge in that place. Will, and it won't be until we get to heaven that we'll see that uh, those, two, uh, those two things finally merge. And so let me sum up these first two verses, 13 and 14, by putting it like this. Just as God chose the Thessalonian believers from the beginning, at that very same beginning, He chose all of you. He chose you, He chose you, He chose you, He chose you. He chose all of you. He chose you that are watching. That's why you're here at church these Bibles right in front of you at this very moment. That's why you're here reading God's Word. That's why you're at home listening to this message. And you could be in bed, you could be watching TV, you could be doing something else, you could be just wasting time on watching dumb, you know, cute little puppy videos on YouTube, but here you are. You could be out there, and you are. Many of you are. You're stuck in a world that is unsatisfying and destruct destructive, but you're here now. The Lord has you here. For those of you who are saved, for those of you who have been born again, the Lord chose you to be saved. Wait a minute, you are probably saying, didn't we just read that God will not override our free will? Yes, <coughs> God's sovereignty and man's free will dwell side by side throughout the scriptures. 
It's only in our finite minds that the two cannot be reconciled. If you ignore the t- God's tug in your heart, it's going to be because you are not chosen by God. But if you decide to respond to that tug, if you choose God today, it's going to be because He's already chosen you. So choose Him. You have that free will to choose or reject them, but I'm telling you now, choose him, my friends. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole 45 minutes discussing, you know, the God's election and man's responsibility, man's choice. But as I said, when I get to it and whatever passage I'm in in the Bible, then we'll talk about it. But again, you can spend weeks, months on this particular subject. Well, moving on, the same God who ordained the end, salvation, also ordained the means to the end, belief in the truth. Paul says in verse 14, He called you to this through our gospel. And let me remind you, gospel means the good news. And here, specifically, he's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. The person who says, God already has his elect, so there's no need for us to pray, to witness, and send out missionaries, doesn't understand Divine election. See, the greatest encouragement to evangelism is a knowledge that God has His people who have been prepared to respond to His word. Let me repeat that the greatest encouragement to evangelism is a knowledge that God has His people who have been prepared to respond to His word. All you have to do is read Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 11 to understand what I mean. See, in order for God to fulfill his eternal plan, he sent Paul, Silas, and Timothy to Thessalonica to preach the word of God. What was ordained in eternity was accomplished in time. God used human instruments to bring the gospel to the lost. And by trusting Christ, these people proved their election of God. The call of God went out to the whole city, to the entire city of Thessalonica. Everyone must have heard it, or the majority of the people must have heard it. But it was only effective, but it was effected only effective only in those who believed the truth and trusted in Christ, in Christ. In other words, they believed the good news of Jesus. They believed the good news that Jesus came and died to forgive them of their sins in order to give them eternal life. As I've already mentioned, it's dangerous to engage in idle speculation about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Again, as I said, both are taught in the Bible. We know that salvation is of the Lord, as, as, as it says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, and that lost sinners can never save themselves. We must admit there are mysteries to our salvation. We'll never be able to figure it out. We can't figure everything out. If we did, we'd be equal to God. He knows everything. There's, our finite minds cannot, will never be able to fully grasp 
everything. There are a lot of mysteries to our salvation, but here's the thing, we can rejoice that there are certainties on which we can rest. We mustn't use the doctrine of election to divide the church, to disturb the weak, to confuse people. We must use it to glorify the Lord. The last part of verse 14, we see that what began in eternity past reaches its climax in eternity future. We share in the glory of God. What begins with grace always leads to glory. This is quite a contrast to the future assigned to the lost. The Bible says that believers already possess God's glory within. The Holy Spirit that lives and dwells inside of you. That's God's glory. You have God's glory within you. So now all we're waiting on is the return of our Savior, the return of Jesus. And then the glory shall be revealed. It'll all be made known. When sinners believe God's truth, God saves them. When they believe Satan's lie and reject the love of the truth, they cannot be saved. Being neutral about God's truth is a dangerous thing. Being wishy-washy, being like, yeah, I believe what God says is true, and, but I also believe there's other truths out there. No, it's either God's truth is the truth, or, and everything else is a lie, or you know, you're calling God a liar. But yes, as I say, being neutral about God's truth is a dangerous thing and has tragic eternal consequences. So now in view of their calling, Paul stated back in, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, that the Thessalonian believers were to maintain their present position of faith in God care for the brethren, and hope for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And in verse 15 in our passage, he now tells them to stand firm. He tells them to stand fast. Again, verse 15 there. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. Thessalonians were in danger of loosening their grip on the apostles' teachings, which they had received in person from the missionaries and from, and from their letters. Again, remember, Paul was there. He planted this church. He spent considerable time with these Thessalonian believers. He taught them a lot, he showed them a lot. He also had already written them a previous letter, a letter we covered a few weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians. So he's telling them, listen, pay attention, do the things that we taught you. Follow those traditions. Follow what we showed you. See, they were those believers Again, we're in danger of slipping backwards in their Christian experience because of the pressures of their trials and their daily negative influences of the world. The flesh also and the devil. They were in danger. Maybe there's some believers out there as well 
You're slipping. You're slipping backwards. You already have begin, begun that backsliding because of the pressures, negative influences, the lust of the flesh, and the lies the devil is telling you. Even as believers, even as Christians, we're also in constant danger of being swept downstream by the currents of ungodly culture. Already, there's so many churches out there that are looking just like some of the horrible things that society is teaching are accepting those doctrines, accepting those, te- bringing them into the church, calling themselves progressive Christians. Again, some have already been swept downstream. We're also prone as Christians to let the truths we know And the relationship we enjoy with God to grow cold. Have you asked yourself that question lately? Is my relationship with God right now, is it cold? Or is it on fire? Well, if it's the former, I encourage you to find a place. Find a place at home, here at church, wherever you can. And ask the Lord to rekindle that fire. Ask a brother and sister to pray with you, to help you. Don't let the love of God, your love for God, grow cold. There's nothing better to be there in that warm fire of God's love. But again, because we're prone to let our love grow cold and to be swept downstream, we need to vigorously hold on to what we've been taught by God's servants, by God's special people, their ambassadors, God's ambassadors, church fathers, their teachings, their writings, missionaries, evangelists, to those espousing truth. Truth. Not tickling your ear. Not saying what is going to be easy to say and in order not to be canceled or be rejected. No, speak the truth, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what it may do to them. Hold on to what you've been taught. I know I have. And that's why I be here at Fresh Fish and Calvary Chapel, try to hold on to many of the traditions that Pastor Chuck showed showed us, especially the tradition of teaching the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's one tradition that we hope here that will continue on and on even after I'm gone. All right, well, it's not enough to believe the truth and guard it. We must also practice it. If we hear the word, don't obey it, we're only fooling ourselves. The last two verses of this chapter record Paul's desire and prayer for his friends. He wanted God to encourage them Raise your hearts and strengthen them in every good word and work. Both of these words 
are prominent in the Thessalonian letters. See, when Paul was with them, he encouraged them individual as a father does to his children. He sent Timothy to encourage them, and Paul himself was greatly encouraged by Timothy's report of their faithfulness. Paul encouraged them to walk, to please God, and to grow in their love for others. He taught them about the rapture of the church in order that they might encourage each other to calm their fears. He explained the day of the Lord to them. In addition to his teachings, he urged them to minister to each other, to serve one another, strengthen or establish some translation uh, in the Lord is also an important theme. Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica that he might establish them in their faith. And Paul prayed that God might establish them. The child must be taught to stand before he can learn to walk or run. See, it's God who establishes it, who establishes it's God who establishes, but He uses people to accomplish His work. A great need in our churches is for Christians who will take the time to establish younger believers. Group Bible studies, men Bible studies, youth, youth Bible studies, women's Bible studies, all those are very valuable, as are the public meetings, the Sunday morning church services. They're just as important. But here's the thing also. Individual discipling is also important. So I ask all of you here, those that are watching, if you're a believer, and want to be discipled, ask any of us, and we'll help you find someone that will disciple you. If you're watching this and need some help in finding a church or someone to disciple you, and help you look into that, and help you find a church in your area, maybe I can get hold of the pastor and we can find someone there, a more mature believer that will help you, will help disciple you. You need more mature, as a young believer, you need mature believers to be around you and to show you how to, how to walk as a believer. In regards to Discipling, Paul encouraged the Thessalonian believers on a one-to-one -one basis. And what he was saying here is that they should also follow his example. We should follow his example. We see Jesus do that too. Yes, he taught them in large groups, but he also took time to speak to each and every one of his disciples one-on-one. -on -one. We see examples of that in the Gospels, in the, in the different uh, Gospels. But it, it's clear. He liked spending one-on-one -on -one time with his disciples, his apostles. Now, Paul was also concerned about two aspects of their Christian life, their word and their work, their saying and their doing. If our walk contradicts our words, we lose our testimony. Our walk and our talk must agree. Good works 
and good words must come from the same yielded heart. Walk the talk if you're a Christian. Walk the talk. It's so important. Let me repeat that. If our walk contradicts our words, we can lose our testimony. Our walk and our talk must agree. Good works and good words must come from the same yielded heart. Friends, we're not saved by good works, but good works are the evidence of salvation. It's not enough to depend on good words. The words must be backed up by deeds. It must be a steady practice, not an occasional one. We must be established in our words, in our words and works. We must be strengthened in our words and works. How is this possible? How is this possible? Answer simple. Only God can do it by His grace. And this, my friends, is what Paul desired for his friends. God has given us eternal encouragement and good hope through His his grace. Notice that Paul's words united the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father in such a way that he affirmed the deity of Christ. The two names for God in chapter 2, verse 16 are governed by a singular verb, not plural, which means they're equal. He used this same construction back in his first letter in chapter 3, verse 11, again affirming the equality of the Son with the Father. There are too many Christians today emphasizing, guarding the truth, but downplay the living of the truth. They emphasize guarding the truth, but downplay, downplay living the truth. One of the best ways to guard the truth is to put it into practice. It's good to be defenders of the faith, but we must not forget to be demonstrators of the faith. Lazarus, you know who Lazarus is, right? Lazarus didn't have to give lectures on the resurrection. Again, be a defender of the faith. But don't forget to be a demonstrator of the faith. Again, with Lazarus, he didn't have to give lectures on the resurrection. People only had to look at him, and they believed. That's the guy that was dead. That's the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. I believe. All right. Well, now, in the next part that we'll be reading, Paul will now, he feels the need now to, for the prayers of the saints. He asks now for their prayers. So let's read that first five verses of chapter three. If you have your Bibles, again, 2 Thessalonians chapter three. And there Paul writes, In addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord about you. You are doing and will continue to do what we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and crisis and Christ's endurance. 
this chapter opens up with, his, with Paul's request for prayer in three areas. First, Paul asked for prayer for the dis- dissemination of the message. He starts off by saying that his desire is that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly. This is a graphic picture of the gospel sprinting from place to place in spite of the obstacles. His second request is that they pray for the triumph of the message. His desire that the word will produce the same type of spiritual and moral changes in other places like it did in Thessalonica, that it be honored as it was in Thessalonica. His third prayer request is for the preservation of the messengers. Paul hopes that he and his fellow companions, his work co-workers, his fellow missionaries might be delivered from the wicked, from wicked and evil people. See, there's nothing more irrational than people's opposition to the gospel and its messengers. And truly, it is difficult to explain. Have you ever tried explaining the gospel to someone who, by all means, is a very smart and rational person? Right away, they begin to get irrational. Again, it's hard. Something happens in the heart, in the mind of those people. They will talk about politics, science, and a host of other subjects without a problem. But the moment you start to share the gospel, when it comes to the gospel, they lose all sense of reason. All, all their reason, everything just gets thrown out the window. Rational thought. It gets, they sweep it under the rug and all of a sudden they become ir- irrational. But now I don't want you to miss the beauty of the contrast between verses 2, not all have faith, and verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. This teaches us to look away from faithless men to our never-failing God. He is faithful to confirm us to the end. He is faithful to deliver us out of temptation. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And here, He is faithful to establish and to guard us from the evil one, or in other words, Satan. In verse 4, Paul reminds the saints of their responsibility to do the things he commands them. Here again, we have a wonderful and curious mingling of the, dem- of the divine and the human. Let me read that again. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we commanded you. It's the same thought in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Kept by the power of God, that's his part. Through faith, that's our part. We also see it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation, our part, for it is God who works in you, his part. Verse 5 then shows us that in times of persecution, it's easy to develop bitter thoughts towards others and to give up because of the duration and intensity of the suffering 
It's for this very reason that the apostle prays for the Thessalonians, prays that the Thessalonians will love as God loves and that they'll endure as Christ's, Christ endured. Again, he writes there, May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. Christ Christ's endurance. In some older translations, this particular verse, the patience or the endurance of Christ would mean steadfastness while waiting for Christ's return. Church, Fellow believer, brother and sister in Christ, He is coming for us. This has been the theme of Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians. And he related this truth to everyday practical living. We are God's children. We are God's ambassadors but in a sense, we're also God's soldiers. And as His soldiers, we must be sharing the word. For one day, He will return and ask for an accounting of our lives. So, will you, when that happens, love His appearing? Or, as First John Chapter 2, verse 28 says, Will you be ashamed before him at his coming? Ask yourself that question and answer honestly. If he was to appear right now, right in front of you, will you be ashamed? Or will you love his appearing? Now, this word command, it's an interesting word. Almost anyone who has served or is serving in the military will tell you that they obey orders primarily out of loyalty and fear. Again, primarily. I know this because I myself has been, have been, was in the military, was in the Marine Corps. There may be other reasons why some obey orders, but it's primarily or typically out of loyalty and fear. But if you're a Christian, you have much higher motives for obedience. What are those motives? the love of God, and Christ's return. In John 14, 15, listen carefully, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you claim to love Jesus, if you tell people you love Jesus, He says, keep my commands. Again, it's that aspect of walking the talk. Your walk and your talk must align, must be aligned with one another. There mustn't be a contradiction there. See, a commanding officer doesn't require his men, to love him. But if they do, they will respect and obey him with even greater diligence. The history of warfare records historic deeds, heroic deeds, done by men who loved their leaders and willingly died for them. Our Savior, on the other hand, loved us 
and died for us. You have a Savior who loves you and died for you. This is the case. If you know this for a fact, if you know that Jesus loves you and died for you, shouldn't you obey him as his child, as a Christian, as a born-again believer? Shouldn't you obey his commands? Difficult and challenging, but as you draw near to him, as you come closer to him and know him more, it will. It'll get, it'll become much easier. And then next thing you know, he's working on another aspect in your life. But again, look what he did for you. Consider what he did for you. Now, if I were to sum up, again, what we covered here in these two passages that I read, I'd say there are four great responsibilities for us as Christians to fulfill. Believe in the truth. Guard the truth. Practice the truth. And share the truth. If you fulfill these duties... As Christians, you will experience joy and power in your lives and growth and blessings in this church. Believe the truth, guard the truth, practice the truth, and share the truth. It's out there. And it's available for you. The truth is there. It's available for you to receive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the truth. Follow him, listen to him, and everything will begin to make sense. So if you're tired of following all these falsehoods that led you to nothing but dead ends, who have left you disappointed and empty-handed and completely destitute, I want to invite you to the cross. And there, I want you to ask Jesus to forgive you of all your sins. You know what? Jesus loves you so much that he will, regardless of what you've done and how bad it was. There was a time I used to think I was the worst of sinners, just like Paul said, and I'm sure that you probably thought the same thing. But when you realized, when you found out that he will forgive you for everything. He will forgive everything. And when he did, it was like a million pounds was lifted off of you. Your heart became free and and the Holy Spirit made his home in there. If that's what you'd like, if you'd like to receive forgiveness of your past, present, and future sins, come to the cross and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If you need help with that, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. With all your heart, with all sincerity, 
Close your eyes and bow your head and pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and three days later you rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me, to fill my heart with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, man, there's a celebration going on in heaven right now for you. Let us know. Reach out to us. You want to hear your story. If you need help in your next steps of your Christian, new Christian walk, we can help you with that as well. Friends, believe the truth. Guard the truth. Practice the truth. And share the truth. Have a great day. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.